Guten Morgen, Dormats and Megalomaniacs. Should know the score by now, who I am, what this is all about. Danny, my own worst enemy, yada yada yada. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, I've gotten quite a bit more relaxed in my presentation recently, over the past few episodes. We're coming up, we're coming up to 30 episodes soon, right? And <laughs> I was skimming back through some of the early episodes the other day, and sort of having a a bit of a chuckle at myself, sounding like a right stiff. Hello, my name is Danny Whitaker. This is my own worst enemy, Mental Health Podcast, where it's my job to speak to some of the biggest and brightest minds in the world of mental health, all with the aim of hopefully helping you improve your own mental health. Like, yeah, all right, mate, get on with it. Like, I actually thought that sounded good <laughs> back then. It's quite sweet, really. I was just trying my bestest. <laughs> sort of like, uh, remind myself of, uh, like one, like an intern turning up to his first ever job wanting to make a good first impression. Like, yeah, my mum's eyeing my shirt for me and I've got a little pleat in my pants and, and I bought myself some posh little pointy shoes that I've polished to a silver sheen. <laughs> yeah, it was never going to last, that facade. I've never been polished or professional at anything in my life, so... Yeah, I'm not going to start now when I'm nearly 35. I think as time goes on, I'm getting more like, more like Sweaty Dave, the office supervisor. Nothing going on in my life but carbohydrates and pessimism. <laughs> like my desk is just littered with Pringles tubs and Swiss roll wrappers. I sat there sort of mopping the jam from round my chops with the same scruffy moth bitten tie that I used to dry my armpits with. <laughs> I don't think it's quite that bad yet, actually, but we're getting there. I think at the moment I'm more like um, more like that mate you've known long enough where you don't have to ring the doorbell anymore when you go around to the house. Just let yourself in. It's fine. I might not be wearing any pants, but don't worry about it. Feel free to de-pant and join me. <laughs> even, if, even if you're not wearing underwear, it's fine. Not bothered. <laughs> right. Anyway, not published an episode for a couple of weeks. Uh, and that's because we're currently redecorating five rooms in a seven-room house. Yeah? Chaos. New wallpaper, new carpets, replastering the works. Looks like a bleeding bomb's hit it. If you didn't know any better, you might be forgiven for thinking that maybe Kim Jong-un had accidentally got our postcode mixed up with downtown Los Angeles and sent one of his missiles down our pissing chimney. For the past week or so, I've not even been able to see my computer desk, let alone sit down and actually get some work done. So, yeah, I'm only mentioning it because I've been absolutely inundated with an email asking when the next episode is going up. So, uh, yeah, I think I might bung a picture up on Instagram or something just so you can see the kind of squalor that I'm living in at the moment. So, yeah, apologies for my lackadaisical work ethic of late. Anyway, today's episode, the holy grail of psychotherapy. My guest today is Dr. Warren Mansell, but before I introduce him properly, I think a little preamble might be in order. Okay, so if I just spent this intro telling you that we're going to be spending this episode talking about transdiagnostic approaches to psychological disorders, something called perceptual control theory, and method of levels therapy, your gut reaction might be, bollocks to that nonsense, <laughs> I'll give this one a miss. So, just in case, let me give you a little taster of what we're dealing with in this episode to sort of whet your appetite, and hopefully encourage you to stick around, because I promise it's worth it. Okay, so, basically... Back in like the early 2000s, the DSM, which is the um, uh, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, had something like um, 300 or so mental health disorders listed in it. So Warren and a bunch of his colleagues back then sort of wanted to explore whether there might be some common factors that link all these disorders together. So they took what's known as the adult axis one disorders okay so calm down right the disorders in this category are basically like all the usual suspects depression anxiety ocd ptsd bdd 
hypochondriasis, depersonalization, and even uh, like sexual disorders, gender dysphoria, anorexia, bulimia, insomnia, gambling, substance abuse, even schizophrenia and bipolar. Now, when you include all the various like derivatives and <laughs> rare gold-plated special edition versions of these various disorders, there's something like about 130 of them or something in this Axis 1 category. So, they scoured the literature, compared all the research, and they discovered that there seems to be about, at the time anyway, there was something like 12 to 15 categories of thought patterns and behaviours and memory processes that were like common across pretty much all of them. So, so yeah, think of that. 130 disorders distilled down to 15 common psychological processes. But then they decided to go that one step further and ask, well, you know, what if these 15 or so processes all have something in common as well? Well, turns out they do. Turns out that these 15 things all relate back to one core underlying process. So think about that for a moment. 130 mental health disorders, the same thing causing each and every one of them. Now, I'm not going to spoil it for you, okay? You're going to have to listen to the interview to find out what it is for yourself. But, yeah, think of the upshot of that. If there's a, a single core psychological process responsible for all these dozens and dozens and dozens of mental health disorders, then all we need to do then is develop a, a therapy to help address that core issue, and you've cracked it. You've got a universal therapy. No more piss fighting about trying to decide between CBT or ACT or person-centered counseling or Freudian psychoanalysis. You can chuck all them in the bin because it'd be like finding the holy grail of psychotherapy. Well, guess what? <laughs> They've already invented it. It's called method of levels therapy. And that's what we're going to be introducing you to with this episode. So... My guest today is Dr. Warren Mansell. Warren is a senior lecturer and clinical psychologist at the University of Manchester, specialising in psychological approaches to bipolar disorder, transdiagnostic interventions for mental health problems and perceptual control theory. In 2011, he received the British Psychological Society's May Davidson Award for his outstanding contribution to the field of psychology in his first 10 years since qualifying as a clinical psychologist. And he's the author of a number of books, including The Bluffer's Guide to Psychology, Coping with Fears and Phobias, A Step-by-Step -step Guide to Understanding and Facing Your Anxieties, and the book which forms the basis of today's conversation, A Transdiagnostic Approach to CBT Using Method of Levels Therapy. You can follow Warren on Twitter. He's at Warren Mansell, nice and simple. As always, if you'd like to comment on this episode... You can do so by going to myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. That's also where you'll find the show notes, which you may very well need for this particular episode. Um, oh, yeah, one final thing. Okay, so Warren has been um, kind enough to offer me a free method of levels therapy session to kind of give it a whirl. And um, yeah, because it's, it's kind of tricky to conceptualize our a therapeutic method works particularly when you're not at all familiar with it so i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to record our conversation and um, provided nothing too bizarre or embarrassing comes up during the session like i don't know discovering like all my mental health problems are linked back to some suppressed childhood memory where i got caught suckling the teeth of a taxidermied moose or something what i'll do is i'll publish it as an episode of the podcast for you guys to listen in on and uh and yeah if, if warren has the time maybe we could spend half an hour sort of deconstructing what took place as well sort of like a a post-game analysis because uh yeah i think that i'd make a a good addendum to to this episode so uh yeah anyway i need to uh Go get back to putting my shit all of an out back together again. So while I do that, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Warren Mansell. Right, okay. Warren Mansell, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Hello. 
Um, oh, right, okay. So I've done some tricky subjects in the past. <laughs> but this one is going to be very complex, I think, for the for the layperson, the person that's coming at this with absolutely no prior knowledge. So I'm just well, going to... hopefully I can put it across in a straightforward way. Well, I'm, I'm hoping so. So let me just give the listeners a little clue to what we're dealing with here. So there's going to be three concepts we're covering. One is a transdiagnostic approach to psychological disorders. Then something mm-hmm. called perceptual control theory. <laughs> and then mm-hmm. uh, a therapy that comes out of that called method of levels therapy. And I can pretty much guarantee yep. that um, 99% of the listeners are going to have not heard of any of those. <laughs> so, um, and I'll tell you what as well, this morning, so I've, I've been out and about, ended up having a, a sports day. My little lad had a sports day that they sprang on us. It was supposed to be last week. They cancelled it and then they, they, they put it on today. So I'm tripping my bollocks off this morning with agoraphobia and depersonalization at about level seven. So my concentration <laughs> is going to be at an, a, a, a very low level as well. So you've definitely, you've got to take all that into account <laughs> and try and make this as simple as possible while still cramming Bye. everything in, I think. So good luck, Warren. Yep. <laughs> this should be fun. Okay, so let's, um, oh, like I always like to start with before we get into the thick of it. If you tell us a little bit about you, how you got into psychology what the draw was uh, a right. little bit about your trajectory um yeah just a little bit about you first okay yeah i mean i've i've always been fascinated in science and it was probably really biology more than anything i used to kind of go bird watching and collect in insects and keep tadpoles and a lizard and you know so i've always been into science um i've been pretty good at it so I just wanted to do that when I went to university and I wanted to do an area that was kind of I was going to find out something new um, so I was interested in like evolution genetics um, but I was also interested in the brain and the mind I remember seeing a documentary uh, as a teenager called the mind machine and and you know I was just fascinated by the brain I thought this is going to be something interesting to do um, I did the degree that was natural sciences so I could I'd started with biology um, but I honed in and did psychology in my final year and <laughs> uh, there's a long and a short answer to this but basically I, I did secure myself a place getting a PhD in Oxford and it was in a clinical area it was actually looking at social anxiety social fears and so I worked on that for, for many years and met lots of clinical psychologists in that role and over the time I got more of an understanding and got more of a confidence that this was an area that I could practice in and actually contribute to. I've got to ask I'm interested in 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 the segue from like the the biological sciences into psychology just because and like you were saying it's all very your interest is very science-based a lot of people would argue that psychology is not actually a science and that you can't necessarily apply the scientific method to it. So how did that, how did you make that segue? Um, I think that there are different levels of scientific explanation. And I think that one of the biggest issues is that issues of mental health and well-being and society get reduced to the wrong level of scientific explanation. They get reduced to the level of the gene or the level of the chem, the chemical in the brain, etc. And that's not what science, proper science is about. It's, it's a science, proper science is about knowing the right level to explain something that you can, that you can see and that you can experience. And very often that level should not go into some very spurious connection between something in a, a microscope you can't see and and some other idea in someone's head you can't really be sure about. The connection between those is just not there. And I think it's really, it's it's really, I, I, I would share some other people's concerns about how science is used to try and draw those connections. Because I think unless you've got a, a plausible connection between those two things, um, it's not scientific theory. And so, yeah, so I just think of science in its, in its broader sense, which is basically trying to understand what we experience 
and trying to find some general themes or general ways that um, what we learn from one person can be used to help another person. Well, yeah, speaking of segues, that's the perfect segue into introducing this topic, which is, um, sorry, <clears throat> man flu. I've had it for weeks now. <laughs> um, yeah, so this, yeah, let's get started with this. So this transdiagnostic approach to psychological disorders. So I guess, firstly, what do, what do we mean by transdiagnostic? If we can kind of define that first. Well, let's just let's just put my cards on the table. This this was an exercise to deal with what's already out there, which is a, a system whereby people's distress has been carved up into categories uh, called diagnoses um, and um, particular treatments like medical treatments or sometimes psychological treatments have been selected for these different categories of what really is just people going through life and having problems. So we had to find some bridge between that existing literature, which talks about psychological disorders and diagnoses, and the reality, which is people having really tough lives and stuff going on in their heads that they are confused about and need help with. And the bridge is to show that all of this data that's out there collected by people who have been categorizing things up into these different 300 about categories of people's suffering. Actually, when you look at all of this, you see that it's just saying the same thing over and over again. People just have been duplicating the same work under different names for, for decades and proposing they've come up with a new treatment for a new diagnosis. And our book, which came out in 2004, basically points to all of that using their data and says, well, actually, you're all saying the same thing because there are some core elements to what what keep people distressed. And that, and it doesn't matter what their diagnostic label is. It's still the same things that they're thinking and doing in the same way they're related to themselves and their emotions and others. It's ir it's irrelevant what diagnosis they've got. And you, we could have said that like I have in a very polemical way or you could systematically prove it by doing the review that we did in 2004. And that, that's what the book does. It's a very systematic review of the literature to show that however hard we scoured the literature, we couldn't find a process, a psychological process that was unique to a particular so-called psychological disorder. Wow. OK, so a couple of things there. So. Yeah, before we kind of get into speaking about the like the, the processes, like these core processes that are um, the mm -hmm. common to all disorders. Yeah, my first question is, do, so do you, do you come from a place where you feel that um, the, the, the current, the classification system that we've got, the DSM, is invalid? That it doesn't, it, that it's... It's either it's not scientific or it's it's outdated. It needs to be done away with. Where do you stand on that? Well, the way I do this, so I put people uh, when I'm giving a lecture, I give them this metaphor, and I say, imagine you are setting up a sanctuary for sick birds in your local area. Okay, and you're bringing in wild birds and domestic birds and making them well. If you could only invest in one book to uh, train everyone in that sanctuary, which book would you would you um, invest in? Would you be invest in The Spotter's Guide to Birds, which is highly scientifically valid and tells you exactly what species of bird you're dealing with? Or would you invest in the bird care book, How to Keep Any Bird Healthy and Happy? That is a book that does actually exist. Yeah. Um, enough, everyone in the audience says, well, we'd invest in the bird care book. And they do that even though the um, spotter's guide is virtually 100 percent accurate and valid and scientifically valid so you don't actually need to disregard the classification system by undermining its scientific validity you just ask the question is this a useful tool for the job and if your job is uh, having a service where you where you want to help people who come in with all kinds of diverse life stories to recover from long-term distress 
um, what is the most effective thing for you to do? The most effective thing for you to do, I think, is to understand about people, understand what people need to get better and provide that. And I am, in my mind, these categorizations of people's distress, sometimes they're valid, sometimes they're reliable, but they're nearly always not the most useful um, approach or the, or the first thing you want to be thinking about when you're talking to someone and when you're starting them on their journey to help themselves recover. Right. The other thing was that, um, like you're talking about, like using the word distress early in that description, you mentioned um, it's kind of an emphasis on the fact that, you know, people have difficult lives. And to me, I don't know if I'm I'm going, going out on a limb here, it sounds very close to the Thomas Zass idea that he puts forth in the in the myth of mental illness, which I, I don't like being reductionist about it because it is a very complex book. But basically, his his hypothesis is that you know mental illness, the, the way it's conceived of, is a myth, and that what people are really dealing with are problems in living, as he called it. Are you coming from a similar, like philosophical uh, standpoint? Not, not really. I kind of I'm always on the fence. <laughs> Um, but I, I feel that it's quite a solid fence when we get to the nuts and bolts of it. Um, there are all kinds of degrees of of mental health and and distress that we experience. And there's all kinds of degree complexities to different people's lives, and there's compl- and there's all kinds of different times and that people have to to work through this. People are, are so different individually, and some people will experience problems of such a magnitude and such a complexity and such a difficulty trying to get their heads around that I think there's a risk of those people be feeling invalidated by sort of putting it down as problems with living. Um, I think that we all have problems with living to some degree and we all have strengths that we bring to those and we all have an inherent limitations as well and some and for some people those challenges are so high that you know they want help with them and they feel like and they know that they've lost control of their lives their life isn't how they want it to be and I think it's down to that individual how they want to explain that to themselves some of those people might find it useful to think of it as a mental illness and others not but I, I think as much as I can I try and um, do justice to that massive diversity of, of, of people uh, without clouding it by putting them into boxes or by making massive generalizations. The theory that I'm going to introduce is just some basic principles of how as living things we function and that doesn't tell us you know who's got the biggest problem it just tells us if we can try and stick to these principles we've all got a better chance of dealing with life problems better. Okay. When did this concept of a like a trans diagnostic approach? When did that first come up as an idea? Is it a, is it a very re, is it a very recent thing or? Well, it, it's almost like a repair of what happened during the middle of the last century, which was this explosion of different types of diagnoses, which, for some re, for some purposes, you can see how it helps people. Sometimes it helps people to find people that are similar got similar problem, particularly, for example, like post-traumatic stress disorder, it helps validate the fact that their problems were, were significantly caused by the trauma that we can uh, un- that we can all understand, rather than maybe before seen as some kind of personal weakness, for example. So you can see why these all these disorders were, were developed and named. But as I said before, the, the problem with that is that lo- there's loads of duplication and there's all kinds of other problems with these labels too, like stigma. Um, but before this happens, most psychological theories were were not were, were theories of general psychological functioning. So the early psychodynamic theories were there when there was quite a, a simple kind of diagnostic system. And so Freud's theory, for example, was a general theory of, of functioning. Um, although I think he did talk about different facets of problems. 
And equally, Carl Rogers, his theory was a general theory. And even a, a cognitive therapist, uh, Albert Ellis, in the 50s, his was a general theory. Then as we go, 60s, 70s, 80s, this massive kind of development and these, and these specific therapies for specific disorders came out. Um, and then it was the word transdiagnostic. The first person it seems to use it was Christopher Fairburn and colleagues, uh, Rod Shafflin and Zafra Cooper, in applying to eating disorders, where they described it as uh, across the different eating disorders. But as I understand, well, as I understand it, we were the first people who then applied it um, wholeheartedly to across the whole of the mental health spectrum. Right. Seems like a ballsy move, to be honest, just from the outside looking in, to just go, hang on a minute, let's see if we can apply this to everything. And then for it to work, because I've read a couple of your books now, and this, yeah, this is a very convincing, very convincing approach. So, yeah, let's get stuck into this now. I think, um, yeah, it kind, of, it kind of begs the question, I suppose. The biggest question is, what are these core processes that we find across all the different disorders. And I think rather than rather than give like a, an exhaustive account of them, because there are quite a few and they all need defining, I think what would be better for the listeners, a better way of doing this for the listeners would be if you could, if we could kind of ground this in, in certain disorder, in certain so-called disorders and if you could show us maybe what, you know, what depression and OCD have got in common, what anorexia and agoraphobia have, have got in common, and maybe do it that way, if that's possible. I might find that hard, but I still think I can make it accessible, hopefully. Okay. Um, I need to restate our conclusions first, which is actually, we, we, did, we have found that these different processes, just like labelling lots of different disorders, has also been a bit of a duplication exercise um, in the later work that we've done. But in the work we did about 10 years ago, we were just trying to find, so if you thought of something like worry, for example, which is about thinking about the worst thing that could happen in a situation, that is classically used as a defining criteria of what's called something called generalized anxiety disorder. But actually, if you look at um, all the people with any kind of anxiety disorder, they all report worrying much more than the average person. And actually, if you ask people with psychosis, with substance abuse, with bipolar disorder, with, uh, they, they also also report worrying to a much higher level than people that are not seeking psychological treatment. But actually, when you look at people who aren't seeking treatment, they also report worrying too. They just don't worry in quite a, a way that's quite as pervasive in terms of how it interferes with their life, or they don't do it as, as extremely in terms of the, the worst case scenarios they can imagine, for example. Um, so what you actually see is something that's common to everyone uh, that people with all kinds of different diagnostic labels do. And what we find is that the more people do it, to some degree, it can help them in the short term to solve problems, actually, and to and to draw attention to things that are genuine issues in their life. Um, but the more it becomes an exclusive way of solving your problems, rather than, say, talking to other people, rather than problem solving, rather than maybe using expressive forms like art or writing, the more that people use it exclusively, the more it just keeps their problems going or even maybe gives them more uh, in the future. Um, and, that, and you just find that same pattern for whatever the process is. And these processes on the surface look different. So they include pushing thoughts to the back of your mind, suppressing traumatic memories. They include avoiding situations that you're scared of. They include uh, kind of rituals in your mind. Um, they might include starving yourself. They might include uh, using drugs in a way that, again, uh, blocks out difficult feelings. They're actually quite um, varied on the surface. And I guess so, you might ask me a bit later, but what we what we then looked at is what they've actually all got in common. Oh, well, yeah, we'll, de we'll, definitely, we'll definitely get to that. <laughs> it's just, um, so I'm guessing 
one of the one of the a question that might be naturally crop up for a, a, the listener now would be kind of a, I see what you're saying like with you gave us the example of worry but then I don't quite understand how that would apply to depression I don't see how depression is in any way similar to OCD how do we how we how do you reconcile that okay um well most people who have have been depressed uh will have also had some other so-called mental health problem at a time in their lives uh for a lot of people this this could be ocd or it could be gad or it could be post-traumatic stress so there's actually quite a, a small number of people who've only had depression most of them have also had some other mental health difficulty as well so that's one answer to this so there might be some uh, and, and in fact generalized anxiety disorder and depression are one of the most commonly occurring mental health difficulties i think about 80 percent of people with generalized anxiety disorder have, have also had depression and that is because of this what well, we, we think it could be because of this shared process of going over and over in your head the same bad things uh, that might happen and um, a challenge really in in being willing and ready to engage in the more troubling emotional uh, aspects uh, engaging with emotions that one finds very difficult to endure like guilt and anger and and fear and to talk and to find someone and find a, a situation where you're comfortable enough to actually talk to people about the difficult things that have happened in your life does that make sense yeah it does i guess what i'll do is i think in in the in the, in the show notes for this i'll put up the i think is it you got to, about is it 12 kind of definite processes which are common across disorders and then i think there was th three that were a bit ropey or something well there was i think probably research since then might have uh, found those to be transdiagnostic as well but in, at the time of the book there were some limitations to them yeah so does it require that for each disorder as it's classified does it require that all 12 processes are present in every single disorder no Every, is there a minimum threshold that makes it makes this trans no okay <laughs> so <laughs> well the way the way i see what defines a uh, what what people describe as a psychological disorder is whether these processes are pro enough of a problem that the person can't live their lives as they want to and they so they might have real difficulties in relationships or at work and they know on some level that it's it's something that they could be helped by by talking to somebody or to or for some people getting medication and so they will go to their their doctors and they'll explain the problems and they'll get a diagnosis and um, that diagnosis only applies if if it's clear how much that's getting in the way of their lives we see i'm cheating a little bit because i know what this is building up to um so like i say i'm just trying to um i'm just trying to come at it from the listener's point of view so it, it's not that these 12 processes that have been identified are common in every single disorder uh, and just kind of swapped around and uh, have got exist at different levels of intensity that um... uh, to some degree yeah yep yeah. so um yeah you know, i was giving the example of worry and generalized anxiety disorder that's it's the worry gets is, is about all kinds of different topics for someone who who would fit that that diagnosis um whereas the worry can be a bit more can will be more circumscribed onto their particular concerns for for um people who end up with a different kind of diagnosis so for example social phobia is people who worry a great deal around how they come across to others the possibility of being rejected or ridiculed by other people um, so there's more of a theme to their worry right but the thing that ties all this together is and I'll, I'll 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 let you go into this deeper is it's not necessarily these these 12 elements themselves that 
that matter so much. There's an there's a core underlying process that's common across all. Yeah, that that number twelve just came up by chance because that's how many names people have given this process. Yeah. By the time we researched it, could we if we did it now we'd come up with probably seventeen or twenty. I don't know. Yeah. So that's not our number. That's just I just fell out of the review. Um, so the next job is to work out well what are these things all really about, and. I've done three studies now where we've developed measures that on the surface of them measure these large number of processes. Um, but actually, when you look at how highly they're related to each other, so how much when you report doing one of these things, you also report doing another, you find that they're all very related to each other to the degree and there's a statistical way of, of accounting for that. Uh, it's, it's, so this this factor, and that that common factor in these three studies is what actually predicts people's distress and tells you how distressed they are, rather than what's very different about these processes. Um, and so then that begs the question of well, what is this common feature of them all? And in other studies, we've done lots of studies interviewing people about their mental health difficulties and how they've recovered from them. And we've also scoured the literature a bit. And to myself and my colleagues, what seems to be at the root of, of, of all of this is a, a loss of control. People lose, feel they've lost control of their lives as a whole or lost control of something extremely important to themselves, like their relationships or their um, emotions. Um, or their minds, for example. And so because this seems so prominent, um, a while ago I was on the lookout for a theory that explains control and describes how control works. Um, and funny enough, that's control theory. And a particular brand of control theory called perceptual control theory, my colleagues and I find particularly helpful because it boils down control to how we control our experiences, how we control what we sense and what we perceive from our world. And so it lends itself really neatly to trying to understand people's experiences because then we can engage people in a conversation about how they're trying to control different things in their lives. And we can be less concerned about their particular behaviours and the things that they're doing. So we're not tempted to give them advice and say you should do this and not that. Because this theory tells us that what's critical to well-being is being in control of your own senses, your own experiences, not being in control of your behaviour. Um, and actually, sometimes you need to do some quite unusual things to get what you need in life. And so this perspective, we think, is a real window on understanding people's own um, own goals and their own, their own way that they want to live their lives. Well, let's... Before we jump into that, I think this is, it kind of needs a little bit of justification. So, yeah, the reason, I, one of the reasons I said we don't need to give an exhaustive account of all these, these, these common processes across disorders is because at the heart of it is this idea of, you call it inflexible control. Yeah. But I think that needs justifying. Yeah. So what is it? So what are they were in common? What, what it is, and this goes back to, to the, the heart of the theory, which actually goes back to the 60s and 70s. Um, so the idea is that we're all trying to be in control of our lives and we all control different aspects of, of what we of our experience. And we, we're trying to balance and juggle all kinds of things from the very simple things in terms of how we want to choose our meal for that day, right through to you know much more long-term things about how valued we want to be as a as a partner or as an employee, or how much we want to be an honest or kind person, for example. These are all things, they're all things that we're trying to keep going in our lives and, and build up who we want to be. So that begs the question of, well, how do we balance all of these things, some of which are very concrete, others which are very abstract, different timescales, how do we do this? And what the, organize all these things, what's called, called a hierarchy, where we put the important long-term things at the top and the very sort of immediate things like being comfortable in your chair right at the bottom. And 
we use those immediate things as ways of fulfilling ultimately our, our goals and our, our ideals and our values in life. And it's tough work trying to go through life and organize this, this self that we have of balancing all these, all these priorities. Um, and sometimes these priorities are at loggerheads with each other. So think of a, a person who wants to be a, a good dad, but he's terrified of going out away with his kids because he's terrified that they're going to get stuck in the rain, there's going to be a lightning storm, and he's terrified of, of thunderstorms and lightning. So he wants to really overcome that fear because of his uh, the impact it's having. But the other, on the other hand, he really doesn't want to face it. It's it's scary. He jumps every time that um, there's a lightning storm. He thinks that there's he's going to have a panic attack. He's not going to be able to cope. And so, in this person's life, those two things are at loggerheads with each other. There are people who've had trauma from perpetrators who've never been brought to justice, and they'd much rather never think about what happened to them. But at the same time, to bring those people to justice. They're often asked to act as witnesses and remember in detail everything that's happened to them. So they're just two examples of what are called conflicts. They are they are examples of where we want, there's an experience and part of us wants and needs to experience it and part of us would rather never experience it. And that is it's very difficult to resolve that. And it's a lot easier to not even think about it. And so what it appears is in common by all these processes is that they keep those long standing unresolved conflicts outside our awareness and keep us doing things right now that don't even make us think about those major issues and sometimes even make them worse because we're avoiding and skirting around the problem. Because sometimes we might be avoiding those things so hard that we're making more problems of ourselves. So someone who's offered a job promotion and is so terrified of presenting themselves in an interview that they go to length to try and put people off promoting them and avoid them talking to them or bumping to them in the corridor and then avoid thinking about it, etc., etc. And some of the things that people do at their extreme, like using um, drugs or medication or avoiding people altogether and just staying in bed or kind of entering into a fantasy world where they're sort of creating and talking to things inside themselves. These are ways to often try and cope, but don't necessarily get to where they need to be thinking and talking about, which is at the root of their difficulties. Um, and that's what we see when we try and understand why these processes are all similar. That makes sense? It does. The thing that, um, I think the thing that needs tackling is and i noticed in, in a lot of the um in a lot of the literature about pct perceptual control theory the the examples about these conflicting goals so that the you know the distress comes from seeking two goals simultaneously but that are in opposition with one another and a lot of the examples that are given are kind of uh, very circumstantial um, things like job interviews and uh, um, and socialising with people. But how does PCT account for, well, I'll speak from experience, something like generalised anxiety disorder, where there's just this con... It's, it's not necessarily that there is this thing that I want to do, or at least it doesn't feel like that consciously. It's just a general... You wake up in the morning yeah. and you're on edge from the get-go. And wherever you go, wherever whatever you do, you're just on edge. And it's a very physical, yeah. a very physical experience. How does PCT account for that? Well, it's it's very physical, partly because that's where your awareness is. That's what you're noticing, and you're not necessarily noticing the reasons behind it. But what the theory would say is that for any for any these things I've talked about, there are some very deep aspects and some and some situational aspects as well. So the person who's experienced trauma, they on the one hand, they want to be a sane person. And on the other hand, they want justice. They are enduring needs that they have that 
when a court case is coming up, for example, they are going to be at, potentially at loggerheads with each other because every time they try and remember something to eventually get justice for themselves, they feel like they're going mad. Um, so you've got the, 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 the thing that's going on right now and you've got your long term goals that, that are really that are that are contributing to this. And we, and we need to help people find their way around it. Um, we have people with long term goals around sort of dependence and independence. So they, they know that they want to be themselves, be their real self, be an independent person. But on the other hand, they really believe that they need to be dependent on others and other, some other particular people must be with them and must be helping them and reassuring them at all times for them to feel safe. So even though these things you could, you could describe in the situation, they're all about really long term um, important principles that we all, we all have and important senses of things like safety and justice that we all hold. But it's for, the, for, for people who are um, in distress about it, it's often because they've not had the opportunity to see all the connections and to talk it through and to make the links between their current anxiety and these plans and goals that are going on in their life. And so the idea is that a good therapy is one that helps people to make all these connections and actually see that something that seems like it's just anxiety in the moment has actually got its roots in some very deeply held principles that that person has and, and deeply held things that they that, that given the chance they will talk about does that make sense yes yes it does um the next thing is um when we are talking about the uh, someone suffering from a specific disorder the examples i've read it's the person's already kind of in the thick of it they've already got anxiety and then there's these conflicting goals how does PCT account for the emergence of, of a mental illness from somebody going from being completely fine to then developing, say, anxiety or depression? Yeah, I mean, it depends what you mean by completely fine, because all of us are, are on, a, on a, uh, a line at one point or another where we've got troubles and dilemmas and difficulties. Um, so I think it's very tempting to think that you, that you're going from really fine to in a mental health problem but again that's about where your awareness is and it's quite easy for for all of us to just have our awareness on um to just have our awareness on what's going well and to disregard what's not going well so i think sometimes things are building up but you're but people are quite good at, at putting their awareness on oh it's okay it's all really fine but then something comes around that actually actually stops them then being able to keep keep going with pushing their awareness away from their difficulties and suddenly something happens that could be a very severe life event or it could just be they come to a point where they can't keep this strategy going any longer and then at that point they also can't keep their their life going in the same way that they, they've been trying to that point and they feel this sense that it's a breakdown and that, and that things are falling apart. And what that's marked by is them needing help. And um, and then it really does fit this criteria of being what's, you know, comes up in these manuals as a, as a disorder, because then they really do need help with it. They're really struggling to be in control of their lives. So is it that, um, what would be a kind of a, a metaphorical way of putting this? Because it's, it was saying that, control is the, the you know the fundamental aspects of this which is causing distress is it the, well, it's the lack of control that's causing this it's the it's the lack of control that we describe as distress right you see because i was wondering whether it was that for me i felt like well i did feel like i was everything was fine do you know what i mean a bit of stress like nothing unusual the, the, the usual just the usual I can, comp <laughs> I completely fell off the wagon. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like to the point where I could barely even function properly. So it's about whether at that time you're aware of everything you're trying to keep going in your lives or whether you're focusing on things that actually lead you to miss noticing where you're building up problems 
for yourself or where the issues lie. Right. So, so it's it's not so much. It, it's not that for me. It kind of felt like. I started to try and get too much control over my life. It was like I was gripping the steering wheel too hard. The, the steering wheel of life, I was gripping it too hard. And also I was trying to, I don't know, steer about a million steering wheels at the same time and, and, and just keep control of everything. But they seem, they, they seem like two different things going on there. One is that this kind of clinging on for dear life, trying to trying hard to control everything, but at the same time losing control. Is that, is that what inflexible control is? Is well, what what we point to, and I guess I'm not noticing, is that most of the time that we're controlling things, we don't notice that we're doing it. So, you know, when when you're well and you just get up, see people, go go to work, um, you just do things very naturally, and you're not aware of having to make any efforts. But you're doing some extremely sophisticated things. Even just talking or keeping your your head upright takes control but we just do it automatically and we don't really, we're not really aware of us doing it. When we're, when we're really noticing the effort we're having to put into controlling something, um, that's because we would propose that's because of the conflict. That's because there's something there that is really not being addressed or dealt with by all these efforts that you're putting in. And the person's focused on one level of trying to do something Thing, when actually that is not addressing what's at the root of the difficulties. So, um, you know, I can think of people that throw themselves into their work when they're stressed, thinking that's the way that I'm going to cope and I'm going to balance all these things at work, when actually their home life's falling apart at the same time, but they're not actually putting all their effort into that. Or if they are putting effort into it, they're putting their effort into maybe making their case rather than to stepping back and thinking about you know, what's underlying this and what's going on. Um, and so what we would say is that that felt sense of making so much effort in controlling things te is telling you we need to try something different and we need to take a step back and we need to uh, have a chance talking things through and actually see what the problem is and let go of all these increased efforts because sometimes those increased efforts are just making us more and more stressed. That doesn't mean that control is a bad thing. It just means that keeping on doing the same thing is probably not going to be as helpful as trying something different or actually trying to step back and talk through and think and notice what's what's actually going on, on in one's life. And sometimes that's almost impossible to do without talking out loud to another person and them asking you questions. You know, it's it's a it's a tough process sometimes and we take it for granted sometimes that we've got some outlet for that talking to a certain friend writing a diary doing art these things are sometimes what's keeping people managing these difficulties and, and we probably undervalue them at times yeah it's it's fascinating for me so i mean i'd say i got rid of 90 percent of of what was bothering me through um i did um a, a clinical trial of uh, metacognitive therapy mm. at uclan uh, with a guy called robin bailey genius guy i mean amazing therapist and um but the one thing i couldn't shake and i'm still to this day was was the agoraphobia and 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 the physical symptoms of that and much of uh, of, of mct was kind of doing less and letting letting go uh, of a lot of things not clinging on so so much to, to to thoughts that entered my head and um so yeah that that worked for for most things about like with my mood the generalized anxiety especially oh the the, the panic the panic attacks mm -hmm. wipe them straight out um yeah it's only that's only gonna work that's gonna work for things that you're currently experiencing isn't it but i guess that then there's the question of whether you're wanting already to face some of the, the feelings to do with the agoraphobia yeah this is what i see i'm i'm creeping into this um we're getting into like the 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 third act here with this method of levels therapy and, and we kind of, we'll talk about these kind of the hierarchical conflicting goals because it just makes when i was reading about all this stuff i was like god have i i must have some <laughs> there's some unresolved shit going on <laughs> like deep down or high up, depending on how you look at it. Everyone, everyone has, everyone's got unresolved shit going on. It's just 
whether that unresolved shit is making enough of a problem to want to get some help with it. Oh, <laughs> it's a pain in the ass. But, but I tell you what, though, before we jump into those, there's two, there's two, um, but two important questions I've got really. One is kind of pushing this this idea of, of a control, pushing it to its logical conclusion, if you like, or mm. testing it at its most extreme. How does this idea of control account for something like psychosis? Because that seems very, uh, very involuntary. Something one one of the, the the mental health disorders that's thrust upon somebody. Well, let me let me tell. Uh, oh, the irony is. The drugs that are used to treat psychosis are often tested on animals and the way they have to make an animal an, an, a, a, an example of being psychotic, and well, we don't know whether it's really experiencing psychosis, but this is what all the drugs are tested on, is by uh, giving the animal an uncontrollable situation where it has to kind of try and go from one room to another and it's going to get shocked in an unpredictable way, whichever room it goes into. Um, and if you, if you, if you give an animal that situation of conf conflict and threat, uh, uncontrollable threat, um, its dopamine systems go through the roof um, and it changes its apparent personality to the observer. Um, it can't manage its its routines in the same way that a normal an animal would or an animal that hadn't gone through that traumatization. Um, and then if you give it um, drugs that block dopamine, that that tempers the effect to a degree. Um, but it wasn't the lack of dopamine that caused that state. It was the conflict. Right. Oh, as well, I suppose, there's a lot of people that report having psychotic symptoms, but that aren't, aren't necessarily distressed by them and they're, they're quite happy to live with them. And I guess that's... Mm -hmm. that, that's yes. a similar thing with control. If, if you get the psychotic symptoms and they don't bother you, fine. If they do bother you and you're trying to take control over them that's where the distress comes in is, is that accurate yeah so there's no doubt that our brains can go into some very different states when we're either going through this kind of uncontrollable stress or whether we uh, or when we experience certain kind of drugs or um, certain kind of effects to our brain and then i guess that brain state having happened it's then down to us whether we want to keep that or or try and get rid of it and for some people that state that their brain has got into that's allowing them to hear voices um for some people they'll see some value in some of those voices some of the time and then they will will try they will keep that process going others um will try the the hardest to get rid of them and some people are in two minds uh, depending on what the voice says at that time as to whether this is helpful or not the last one, last question now before we move on to uh, method levels. I think it's a trip might be a tricky one. This is with this idea with this idea of control. There's, there seems almost an inherent attribution of blame there, like you're doing this to yourself, <laughs> you know. And um, I, I'm, I'm totally open to that idea. I'm, I I definitely feel that any and all of my my mental health issues are completely self inflicted, but. You know, some some people don't want well, ascribe to that. Some people are going to have, have trouble with that yeah, concept. No, you can't equate control and blame at all with one another. We're born with our control systems, so we're born with certain preferences and needs for, you know, certain body temperatures, for a certain level of warmth and comfort, for certain level levels of stimulation. And we're born with those preferences for what we instinctively want. Um, as we get older, we start to build more sort of conscious awareness of what those preferences are. But we're born with those those uh, those purposes and those those goals. So you can't blame someone for what they're born with. But is it ever the case that maybe, yeah, is it ever the case that maybe somebody's goals are not well? Not necessarily. I mean, the, the the goals that we're born with, very the, the instinctive goals for survival, etc., and food and connection with other people, they're not the same as wanting to be a certain type of person or have a certain type of career and the pressures that you might put on yourself, are they? The twenty on the environments that we've grown up in, they may become equated. So, if you've grown up in an environment where you've had to please another person, your caregiver, at all times 
or you'll be in danger, then you will develop that need to please people and you will start to equate being safe with having to please people all the time. Now that doesn't mean that they are the same thing, but there'll be a, a, an experience or a relationship in that person's life that's that's made that feel like that's true. And part of therapy again is about ha helping people to question those things and to draw up new new ways of, of getting their needs met that are not exclusively linked to being a certain kind of person or to, to related to people in a certain way or suppressing a certain kind of emotion. But they've learned those things through the environments they've grown up in. Um, when we're infants and children, we, we have very little control over who's going to give us and fulfil those needs and keep us safe and keep us fed. So we're going to develop those preferences and take them on board with very little that we could do at that age to change that trajectory. But we're still stuck taking forward those preferences, those goals, those values into adult life. And we're still controlling for them, even though we're not to blame for them or to blame for how they started. Right. And, um, well, this is, yeah, perfect move forward now. So method of levels therapy. So this is, this is kind of tying, tying everything together that we've, that we've spoken about so far, but yeah, first let's, let's kind of pass this out method of levels. So what exactly what does the method part mean and what, what's the levels part referring to? Because I know people are going to be listening and thinking, oh God, another another acronym. We've got CBT and MCT and EMDR or whatever. And so what's what's this one? <laughs> okay. Well, it's, you know, the reader might, might, want, might think it's hard to believe, but it is very different from those other therapies. Most other therapies are an amalgamation of different methods. So there's, you know, there might be uh, assessments and thought diaries and you know, free associations and diagrams and all kinds of stuff's put in the pot uh, and, and often kind of recommended as part of the therapy. Um, method of levels is about trying to simplify to a as, as far as you can go what a therapy needs to involve. And so the method is just to keep to two goals. One is to help the person talk about a current problem and talk about it as they're currently experiencing it. And the other goal is what we call catching disruptions, which is to help people notice background thoughts, notice things that they might have missed or, or, or um, feelings, images, memories, other thoughts, that pass through their mind, but they've either not particularly noticed or not kind of put into words. Um, the reason why we do that is, is down to theory, because we think that that the the route to really solving a long-standing problem is to be able to fully explore it in a in a new way and see it from a new perspective. And to do that, the therapist is best just helping the client just to work through that and expand upon it rather than coming in with their own suggestions or their own tools um etc etc um and so that's why it's a method because it really is just about, about sticking to those those goals and doing nothing else and to restrict as hard as you can <laughs> any other way you might get in the way of that client actually being able to talk about their problem and, ex and explore it, bringing things to minds that they may have never had a chance to see the connection or put into words before without this this forum. Is there any way of, um, I, there's some example interviews online, um, I'll include them in the show notes for people if they want to actually see, see how a therapy session's conducted, but is there any way of kind yeah. of explaining how how the therapy how method of levels is conducted between a therapist and, and a client and how it how it works i mean that's simple the hard bit is not doing the stuff that you'd normally do as a human being or as a therapist trained in other approaches um that's not to mean say that you can't just be yourself but the idea is that the more that you can hone in on the, these goals 
the more helpful you'll be for the other person. And that is it. You just see it. It's just a person listening to someone talking about their problems, listening at every moment, like really attending and noticing everything that person is saying. And then coming in every so often with a question to help that person talk about the problem better and help that person notice things that are maybe just caught at the back of their mind that they've that they've not that they've not connected yet. And as much as possible, not putting the therapist not putting in any of their own ideas or solutions or techniques uh, as well as they can. So the therapist just from from what I understand, the therapist only asks questions. There's no yeah. There's no suggestions made or anything like that. There's no kind of advice given. Yeah, no interpretations as much as can manage it. Yeah. And yeah, there was an interesting thing in in the in the book which really stood out to me was so a way of stripping stripping away or a, a way of kind of working through getting deeper into into somebody's problems was this difference between asking how is it how questions and why questions to somebody mm -hmm. could you just go into that a little bit and explain how that works i thought it was, it was a really interesting concept that it kind of it really smacked me in the face when i read it yeah i mean it's it's they're very broad terms so in therapy we're not asking why 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 all the time and we're not asking how, how, how all the time, but we are interested in helping people notice whether they've got hunches about the way to do things and that they've got a better awareness of, of how this all pans out, you know, kind of. So when, when you, if someone's talking about um, suppressing um, an unpleasant thought, for example, where it will be interested in, you know, is a thought right there now, where does, where does it, where does it start? Where does it go to? Does it change at all as you try and suppress it? And then, it, then we'll start to ask questions like, how do you know when to do it? And what difference does it make when you do it? And how much of a problem is this? And those start to then, so that the how questions start to tell you exactly what, get them a bit more aware of, well, what am I doing and when? And, and get their, them monitoring it a bit better. And, and the why is all about, well, what difference does this make? Why, why do I do this? Is this something that, it's helped me sometimes and not others. And that's about helping them appreciate that, oh, there's reasons why I do this. It serves, it fulfills some goals that I have, but actually it gets away with others. So it helps me to feel like I'm coping right now, but it takes me away from talking to other people um, or, or it um, distracts me for a moment, um, but it makes it harder for me to then deal with the situation that I'm in, for example. Um, so we really, and we really want other the, the client to tell us what what these things are, rather than for us to kind of come across with them like I am now. And so, as a therapist, you're just you're just actively helping the person to bring those out for themselves. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit of in a <laughs> used to do like NLP and stuff back in the nineties, early two thousands, and. Uh, yeah, one of the exercises you do in, in NLP is discovering what your core values are. And so um, I'm wondering if this is similar. So it, with, with that, you'd, you you write your goals out, your ambitions, and say you say, well, I want to be rich. I want a million pounds. So then to find your value that's hidden at the core of this, you say, well, why do you want a million pounds? You say, well, I can buy loads of things. Well, why do you want to buy loads of things? Well, because mm -hmm. I want a better life for myself. Well, why do you want a better life for yourself? Well, because, you know, I've not had a very good life growing up. And you keep working backwards yeah. and backwards and you eventually, you know, you eventually find your core value, which is I just want to be loved or, you know, I just, I want to be close to my family or is that, is that the same thing we're working with? Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that sort of, that sort of um, pattern, you'll see it in, in um, person-centered therapy as well. You see it in something called acceptance commitment therapy. A lot of therapies have, are interested in getting to that, those deeper values that people have and they see the worth but when people start to see things from that perspective you know, ex existential therapy gestalt therapy is about that as well um but i guess well, there's a, a couple of things so one thing is because we think that that's all about helping people establish control the therapist in that level therapist will will be very attentive to helping the client be in control of that process rather than the therapist coming in with their own ideas 
because ultimately it's about the clients navigating their own way through that through that process. And I guess the other thing is Method of Levels just has this theory explaining exactly how why we have these these levels rather than just sort of saying, well, it's all about going to your values. Well, from a from a a very fundamental point, we can see why we have to organize our, our lives in this way, because we have to control and balance all of these different things that we're doing in our lives. And that is what life is about. The theory is something that has been lent to all kinds of areas of science, not just mental health. And, and I think that's because it because it is quite well, it is an accurate theory. And it's a theory that because of that accuracy means that therapist has to be quite uh, strict with themselves as to how they you know, what goals they stick to. So yeah, so you'll see other active and effective therapies going into these places and that's important and that's why they work. Method levels is just trying to do that as efficiently as possible um, on the client's terms as much as possible. Yeah, one thing that I have to I have to say is what I, I, I really don't understand is so th the only thing that got made my <laughs> maybe able to cope with that agoraphobia was like I say that the MCT kind of helped, but f it was for me it was good old fashioned exposure therapy. It was it was getting out there for a little bit more. I had to, ninety something days. I did a written a, di written a diary of it. Ninety something days before the, the the symptoms started to subside, and with method of levels, you were saying that it's. I mean, you don't do these kind of written exercise and thought diaries and, and the same behavioral experiments and that during therapy, you're very much focused on the present moment. So one thing I, I, I don't understand is I don't understand how method of levels translates into the real world, because especially with things like anxiety and, and agoraphobia, I mean, Jesus Christ, the, the physical symptoms of it sometimes. But the physical symptoms are there while you're talking, aren't, aren't they, a lot of the time? Not, I guess... No, I'll go on. I'll go on in a minute about um, situations, but a lot of those uh, feelings and memories and images are exactly what we're helping people to, when they're in their own time, manage and expand upon and and start to deal with while we're talking to them. So I think I think we're in quite. I think when we're talking about physical symptoms, when it's Fairly, we're in fairly comfortable ground because they're there right with you as you're t talking. Um, I guess I would put you, to, I guess, ask you the question who do you think was in control of you going out and doing that exposure? Oh, well, me, totally, yeah. Okay. So it only worked because you had, you were doing it. We've done a study where we've, um, in people who are afraid of spiders, we've had. Uh, allocate people to two groups, a group where they are in complete control of the exposure because they are moving this joystick, controlling exactly how near they want to be to a spider on the screen. And then every one of those participants has a, has a what's called a yoked participant who just gets the exposure that the first person controlled. OK, right. So the exposure is exactly the same. But half of these people are in control of it and half of the people are not in control of it. What you find in that, what we found in that study is that it, it was only the people that were in control of it that got any benefits from this exposure. So, and what this comes, what this comes down to is as a therapist, how am I going to provide what's best for the clients to help them choose willingly on their own terms to expose themselves to the things that they know they need to expose themselves to ultimately to get better. And, and, I th and, and if you look at how these, how exposure therapy is conducted well, it's very collaborative. The, the therapist is listening very carefully to the client. They're breaking it down into steps that are manageable. Basically, they're helping doing it on the client's own terms. What they're not doing is, uh, or when, when it's not as helpful, is when the therapist is trying to persuade or coerce or just say that this is what you need to do. Um, and so that's we wouldn't be doing that with with clients at method levels, but anything that helps the person decide how and when they want to face things that they've that they know they need to face to get better, 
then that's all part of method level therapy. Yeah, so it's yeah. I just wanted to clarify that it's not um, it, it's not like this kind of Freudian idea of if you just dig deep enough and find the problem, you know, abracadabra, all your problems are going to go away, and suddenly the agoraphobia is not going to be there anymore. It all depends on the nature. It all depends on the nature of the problem, and I've certainly had some people who said, um, actually, when I realised this, you know, that was. You know that was what I needed, and that's made a, a massive change. And I've had people that have never got to the, the root of their problems, but but made progress. Um, what you need to, what we need to do as therapists is is balance, uh, help help clients go through and discover what they want to discover as and when they're ready. And but while they're doing that, do things that help themselves. Um, because all of this, none of this is going to work if a therapist comes in and says, you've just got to discover what happened to you as a child. That's so destabilising that you'd feel total loss of control if a therapist says, said that to you. Um, and how does a therapist know that that applies to that person? Hmm. Um, so it's all about helping the client to be in control of this. And that includes being in control of how deep they want to go. And if if they never want to go that deep, that's their choice as well. But we've got the tools as and when they're ready, and we don't know whether what we encounter for someone will be deep enough or not. That's what we just we just wait and see. For some people, the conflicts will be ones that they've not got any issue about talking about. They've just never had a chance to tell anyone about them anymore uh, before. Whereas for other people, they're ones that they know they will never ever tell anyone, and that's their decision. Um, and we'll just we'll just see that fresh every day and they can make up their own minds about it right one final question before i subject you to my quick fire questions from my reading on it um <laughs> you know professional me um so i the the book i read um is your it's a transdiagnostic approach to cbt using method levels therapy and yeah, uh yeah you know what honestly warren a genuinely fascinating book i read all sorts for this i really think you guys are, are, are doing something interesting the one the one thing that i kind of worried about was the advantage that cbt's got apart from you know it's the gold standard and it's it's the one that's got the most funding it's the most well known is it, it's it's easy to see how cbt can be applied in in the self help arena mm -hmm. whereas method levels f for me it just seems like if you take the therapist out of it I, i'm not sure is is the is the room there for it becoming for a, for a self-help approach because i mean you guys have really got an uphill battle uh, yeah, we've going got, uh, a few things so one is we've got um an artificial intelligence agent which is basically a, a computer that scans what you're writing about your problem and asks you questions relating to your problem to help you talk about it in more detail and notice things about it you might not have mentioned. Uh, it's in fairly early stages, but even though that involves another agent, it's not a person. So it's and and the, and the person who's talking into the computer can do it on their own terms as much as they want or not. So it's self help in that in that respect. Um, and we've also got a um, what we call the take control course which is, um, it, is an, it is an intervention. It does involve health professionals, um, but it's a group thing and it's a lot about learning the basic principles of um, control and balancing conflicting goals, um, et cetera. And that's like a six week course um, that, that, we've, that we do. We've got some papers on it and some studies uh, assessing that. Um, so that's more of a sort of low intensity way of helping people to access these kinds of this kind of work. Um, the other thing we do is we do encourage where it's where it makes sense, a form of co-counseling where you can train up people who aren't health professionals to provide method levels at more community level. Um, and as long as that's done done well, we see no reason why that wouldn't be helpful as well. So we think there's quite a few ways of um, translating this work into something that's much more accessible oh i'll tell you what one final final question is of all the therapies i've 
done research for, this one has got kind of the most sparse, so far, internet presence. And why why is that? I mean, it seems, just for me, a layperson, like I say, it's a really, just a really fascinating, especially, especially this PCT, you read about that, it's like, it proper smacks you across the face, a really interesting, intriguing theory, but it doesn't seem, and, and you guys have been working on this for, you know, a while now, what, 15, 20 years or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. How come it's not more out there and more people are talking, more people aren't talking about it? <laughs> um, it's funny. I mean, it's all, it's out there and the, the, the websites are there and, the, and there's loads of papers on it. It's just, it, yeah, it just hasn't made it over into mainstream psychology, mainstream mental health. There are lots of reasons. Um, some simple ones and some sort of deeper ones. Simple ones include the fact that the guy that developed the theory was a, an engineer and not a psychologist. He didn't kind of train up his own set of people to go off and do it in the, in the years when he was developing the theory. Um, it's there's, I guess there might be some of these anxieties that people have about control and think and linking it to blame and sort of the connotations of the word control, which actually our connotations are not actually what um, kind of a, a really <laughs> accurate explanation of what control really is. And I think part of it is also is that people just want to do stuff to people to help them. They think that the more we learn about different methods and tools and the more we say, the more advice we give and the more experts we have, um, the more we categorize things, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the better we'll be able to help. And that's a very not natural instinct. Um, it, what's not particularly natural is to go beneath the surface of all of this and say, what are the common principles of life um, that um, cut across all of this that kind of point to the the kind of Efficiencies, the, the kind of waste of time, if you like, that all these other approaches have had, and I think that's that's really tough, you know, because most of us are, are in our own area with our own camp of people, and we want to carry on doing work that's, you know, with our own terminology and our own sort of frames of reference, and we don't want someone to come from a, a different background who's an engineer and say, look, this is all about some much more basic uh, principles control conflict of organizing things in levels and this applies as much to a person as it does a rat as it does to a, a computer um, or a robot it's just no one what no one wants to hear that you know but i think that is the most i think that that is that is science in its most beautiful way that's renaissance science that's da vinci's kind of science that integrates disciplines and looks for the beautiful simplicity beneath any phenomenon and the phenomenon to explain we think is is control and we can see that happening in all of the in all of the living things and we can see that's what people lose when they get mental health problems and we want to help people restore it again and we want to help them do it from the inside out rather than coming in with our kind of own pet explanations uh, outside yeah, I mean, a good theory is a good theory, isn't it? And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a shame, really. It's kind of that 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 appeal to authority, and you know, just because somebody's an engineer and they don't know what they're talking about in this realm and that kind of institutional inertia, I guess. And the irony is that most engineers don't listen, wouldn't listen to powers either. Yeah, <laughs> because for them, the goal is set outside the machine. You know, you set a thermostat from the outside. They're not too comfortable with thinking that, you know are going on from the inside and they're all related to each other in this very sophisticated way um so you know it powers to develop theories between a rock and a hard place the theory is 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 there uh, and i don't think it's a shame it's just it just is and you know maybe you know maybe it will never get taken on board maybe we have to wait 100 years it doesn't really matter you just as a researcher and a clinician and as a and, and as, as a parent as well you just do things and understand the world in ways you think that works. And for me, this 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 way of seeing the world and people is just it's empowering to myself. And I and, and I can see how 
it empowers others. And I just think, well, it must be pretty close to the right lines then. Yeah, what you need to do, Warren, is you need to write one of these pop like a popularizing book, like kind of like what um, yeah. what Russ Harris did with um, with ACT. You know, and the, the whole the whole thing with with ACT is when you're reading about relational frame theory and stuff, and it's like, oh god. But then he made it very simple, and I think you need it like a controversial a controversial book title like "All Mental Illness Is the Same" or something like that, and then it'll just go it'll go crazy. Yeah, and I like, I like I think the book title might be one of it. The angle I've written that four chapters of that book with Tim Carey and we've been re rejected by about 30 publishers and 30 agents over the last couple of years um, but it's all re ready to go but we I, I don't think we've got the title obviously we obviously haven't got a title and a an angle that's that's making publishers and agents listen I don't know whether about the general public uh, oh self self publish on Amazon do you think I, def I, think I definitely I definitely think yeah mm. I don't think you should wait for wait for permission to to put that kind of idea out there, and especially like yeah, but I know, there's a time, there's a, we're already self published all the time, aren't we? We're always always we've got loads of blogs and websites, and there's loads of self published stuff out there. So that, to me, that feels like that's been that's been done. But maybe if it was a book, that would be different. Yeah. So you just need that controversial title. <laughs> anyway, Warren. Um, Right, my quick fire questions. I'll try not to keep you for too much longer. Um, okay, well, speaking of which, do you have any book recommendations on either this topic or anything else you feel would be of value to the listeners? Huh. And the listeners being virtually anyone or of a particular background? Or... A anybody, whether the lay person, psychology students, just whoever. Um, well, Tim Curry's manual for Master of Levels is on Google Books and it's called Method of Levels, how to do psychotherapy without getting in, in the way. And so that's one that, you know, you can access easily. There's the the book, if people are generally interested in science and, and this theory, there's a book, the book that, that I read that where I came across a theory is a book called Without Miracles by uh, someone called, um, an MIT professor called uh, Gary Zico, C-Z-I-K-O. And that's a very broad take across science, um, which I think is a you know, really neat uh, intro. And feel free to plug your own book as well, Coping with Fears and Phobias. Well, that's just, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that's a self-help book that's, again, control theory does underlie a lot of the recommendations in there, but it's also got a lot of other stuff in there as well. No, I really, I, I really like that book, Warren. It's... Um... What one thing I did right. like about it, which was different than uh, than a lot of self help books, is you yeah. you get str get straight in there with it, you kind of lay out the th lay out the theory a little bit, and then within the first couple of chapters, there's already advice of what to do before we get into the thick of it, which I thought was really good because most books right. when when you oh when you're in the in the thick of it with anxiety and depression. It's just theory, 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 and then the last chapter tells you what to do, and you just kind of want to skip through it all. So I quite like that little touch where it's like, well, it is some stuff to get you going, and then we'll get into it a bit more later. So I really like that book. Yeah, I mean, we, I, I did a book review. I read about 20 other self-help books before writing that and um, and sent them to service users and listened to what they said, and they said they wanted stuff to get started, so that's why that chapter's in there. Yeah, and it, it works, definitely. Okay, um, if you could have unlimited funding to research anything you liked, however niche or bizarre, what would it be and why? <laughs> Unlimited funding. Unlimited funding. Yeah, uh, I guess it would It would be to do a really large community-based trial to see that if you could train people up in, in the community at all kinds of levels, in method of levels therapy, whether you'd get an impact on well-being over time, um, and so if you had unlimited money, you could look at you could look at it in high schools, you could look at it in inpatient wards, you can look at it um, in businesses, and you'd be able to kind of really find out whether equipping people with this perspective and this this style of, of listening to people, whether that really has an impact at a more uh, social level on people's well-being well bill gates if you're listening <laughs> um 
If you could take the reins of power at the Department of Health, what policy would you implement to improve the mental well-being of the general public? Okay. Uh... I think very di- don't don't think like nicey nicey kind of democracy. Think dictator, <laughs> but, <laughs> bene- benevolent dictator, of course, but a dictator. Um, yeah, okay. That everybody who expresses a need to talk about their difficulties and a willingness to talk about their problems, mental health problems, gets immediate access to someone who will listen and that access will circumvent any of their normal barriers you know so if it's someone who won't see someone's face to face then they'll be talked to on a t- telephone or if it's someone who won't leave their house then you know they'll be on telephone or someone will go around but basically basically anyone who's willing to talk about their problems uh, uh, you know and clearly wanting to recover and get on top of their mental health problems has got immediate and open access to that source of um, support. Yeah, access, that's a big one. What's the best piece of life advice anyone has ever given you? I bet some people have got an immediate answer to that. Um, some people do. So a, a lot of people have got a long pause that I edit out. <laughs> yeah. Is that, I guess it might say something that I, I can't think of. <laughs> ne- never been before. given any good advice. <laughs> I, I've never, I, no one's taken the effort to give me a piece of life advice that's <laughs> made a significant difference. I mean, I, I certainly get inspired by all kinds of people, mainly outside mental health. I, I get inspired by people like um, Jamie Oliver and David Attenborough and um people that just kind of totally push the envelope in terms of their their ambition and and they do it in such a a way that draws you in in such a kind of caring and kind of what's the way they just they just kind of draw attention to all kinds of things that are both the amazing things about life and 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 what's terrible that you need to do things about and I, and I like those people that do it in a popular domain but you know I'm not none of those people have ever given me any advice I suppose, I suppose you could hide hijack uh, Gandhi's quote for uh, be the change you want to see in the world that's kind of similar to those people I guess yeah go on then I'll have that one <laughs> right final four these are the big ones what mistakes do you continue to make despite knowing better Hmm, that's a good one. I was talking about popular things. If anyone listens to the Shakira track, Try Everything, from the film Zootropolis, it's a, it's an, an antidote to that that question. Uh, because, yeah, we should always try doing different things and think of things in different ways. What do I do? I, I go quiet when I'm stressed or angry. That's the thing I always do. And... Um, I can see why it's protective, but I can also see why it doesn't solve the problems. Okay. What part of your career are you most proud of? Hmm. Part of my career I'm most proud of? Hmm. I think it, it, I, I think now, I just think now, I just think I'm, I'm always kind of doing stuff that's, a bit beyond what I've done before, so I think it's got just been now, even though there's no particular event, you know, like I got a, a, an award from the British Psychological Society a few years back, you know, and, and that was that's fabulous to get that recognition. Um, but in terms of, no, I think I I'm, I'm think I'm just sort of running on currently where I am. I think I've, I've, I'm as proud as I ever have been, and I guess I want to keep that going. Outside of family and academia, what investment of time or money has brought you the most joy or fulfilment? What? Outside of family and academia? Yeah, because they're, they're too easy. People, people always default to the family. My kids, my kids, my kids are, yeah, academia and the career. So outside of those things. 
Investment of money we're talking about. Time or money. Time or money. Uh, well, I'm just going to go straight to what popped into my head, and I don't know whether it's, you know, right reflection or not, but I used to, as a, as a, as a teenager, when I was a kid and a teenager, I used to spend loads of time just playing on an electronic keyboard, uh, and, and I, yeah, I, I just loved it. I loved doing that. So I'll say that. Do you still play now? No. Oh, you want to get back on it then? I sometimes, sometimes plug a keyboard into GarageBand to play a few odd sounds to, to my sons, um, but I don't play it at the moment. Yeah, But I, I do have a, a plan to, to maybe when they're a bit older to kind of set something up. Okay, the big one. What do you think is the key to happiness? Living the life you want. Living the life you want. Yeah. And do we do that with more or less control? <laughs> um, we do. We do it with um, a lot of control, um, but it's the kind of control that you don't even see it happening because you're just so naturally doing it, and other people are helping you with it, and you're progressing to it that. Um, it's, it goes pretty smoothly. There are times when it doesn't, and sometimes it can get really tough, and you need to really kind of pull on the uh, reins. Um, and at those times, you may be losing control and you get it back in again. Um, so yeah, how much control you have probably varies during that. In general, you're gonna you're when you're doing that well, things are going as you want them to be. You're, you're, you're basically in control, which doesn't mean that you're doing everything. It doesn't mean you're a control freak and you're not letting anyone else do things. Because actually, living the life you want is often about um, easing off on things that aren't as important or letting other people get on with things on your behalf. And so, yeah, there's the, there's the elaborate answer to that. <laughs> okay, Warren Mansell, thank you very much. Is there okay. um, any uh, links, social media? This is your chance to plug away and get a bit of traffic to your websites and stuff. Yeah, okay, yeah, so pctweb.org is the website on the theory and that has also links to the, the mental health and the psychology side um people are very welcome to um follow me on twitter which i, I think my, my twitter handle is at warren mansell um uh, so yeah so they'll probably be the two avenues i think right well i'll include all those links in the show notes and uh, yeah all the books we've mentioned everything like that i'll all be in there and I'll, I'll st stick some diagrams and stuff in there to help people conceptualize some of the stuff we've talked about a bit better oh, wow. um so yeah other than that there may be a few uh you may have heard my wife in the background occasionally you can either keep those in or edit them out <laughs> oh not was you getting told off are we taking too long or something no, no she just came in and went hello <laughs> all right no i didn't we didn't get that but i'm uh, if i do find it i'm gonna keep it in right. Okay, Warren Mansell, thank you very much. No worries. That's brilliant, Danny. No, thanks. Brilliant. Really enjoyed it. Okay, folks, if you enjoyed this episode and you've got a couple of minutes to spare, uh, then maybe you'd consider leaving us a positive review on iTunes or Stitcher or whichever podcast service you happen to use. That would be greatly appreciated. It also encourages other people to give us a listen. If you can't spare a couple of minutes, but you've got a couple of seconds... Maybe you could share one of our episodes with your family or friends on social media. Don't forget you can comment on any of these episodes by going to myownworstenemy.org forward slash podcast. And if you'd like to contact me, you can email me at danny at myownworstenemy.org. Or if email's a bit old fashioned for you, then you can get hold of me on all the different social media channels at Danny D Whitaker. And that's about that. I'll see you again next time.